I'm Simon. Thanks for tuning in to The Ordinary Filmmaker. If you're new here, subscribe to get notification of new videos like this one so you don't miss any news, rumors, or tutorials. And by the way, I'm giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full-frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer. Details are in the description down below, or you can watch this video here, but definitely look at the fine print because there are some regions based on current or local laws where I can't do this type of contest, and there are certain age limits as well, but other than that, all you have to do is subscribe for your chance to win. Okay, so before I get into this week's question and answers, I've got something that's been bugging me. Uh, earlier today, I was looking at one of my videos on my television, and I looked like a ripe old tomato. It, well, I was shocked. I was like, oh my god, am I putting this out? How is this possible? Well, I looked on my iPad, and it looked perfectly fine, and I thought, okay. I, I knew there was going to be slight color differences between each device, and I didn't see the point of testing that because on my Mac I'm looking at scopes, I'm color balancing, and everything looks okay. But apparently on Chrome it looks the worst, I look like a tomato, and on Apple devices, Firefox, I look a little bit more normal. So to counteract this, what I'm trying this week is I'm dropping the saturation a little bit, I'm dropping the red level a little bit, and I came up, came up with a new export uh, profile to help aid me in this. Uh, and previously what I've been doing when I export in Compressor, I, I choose uh, a profile specifically for YouTube. So, I, I apologize if you've been watching on Chrome and you've been tolerating my redness. Um, that's not actually how I look, especially if we come up to winter. I'm pretty pale looking, almost like a ghost. And my fear is that I'll look a little bit too much like a ghost. So I'm trying to balance looking like a ripe old tomato and a ghost. So hopefully this video looks a lot better. Anyhow, let's get to our questions. I got about 22 questions this week. Lewis asks, I want to know how you picked your iMac Pro configuration and what's your philosophy when choosing upgrades? It's a really good question. I actually spent months trying to figure out what my up next upgrade path was and I got really frustrated. Ever since about 2015, Apple's been soldering memory and the storage right onto the motherboard, and this is very, very frustrating. It used to be when I bought a Mac, it would be $3,000, and it would last me a long, long time, and if I ended up selling it early, well, I'd get a lot of that back. But now, when I looked at buying a machine, I figured, well, I need at least a terabyte of memory, but if they're solder, sorry, a terabyte of SSD, if they're looking at soldering that onto the board, well, maybe I need two terabytes, and, and you start to find that the machine you start building, it, becomes very, very expensive. So I built out the laptop that I was looking at getting and it was too expensive. So I said, well, okay, I'm not doing that. Then I started to look at other offerings. Well, the Mac Pro didn't look very good and it was dated, not very easy to upgrade. And when they released the new Mac Pro, that thing was just ridiculously overpriced to the point where there was no chance I was going to do it. But there was one other option, that was the iMac Pro. Now, while the iMac Pro is a sealed unit that you can't upgrade memory to, the RAM, and yes, you can do it on the non-pro model, so the regular iMac, yes, you can update, update the memory. But in three years, if I want to upgrade it, or in two years, if I want to upgrade it, the, act, the actual processors and the memory is, well, you can swap it out. You just have to take it to a service center because you have to pull the glass off and you have to do all that stuff. And that's not something I want to take a chance with. So I know that with this model, I can at least upgrade it. And I also bought it used because, well, here in Canada is around $7,000. and There's no way I was spending that much money on a computer. So that's how I kind of came to the iMac Pro. And when I looked at the specs as 32 megabytes of memory, it's ECC, so that memory is very good. I've never had an outright crash of the system, although Final Cut every once in a while does go down. The nice thing though is that when it comes back up, I've never apparently lost anything. It might have forgotten where I was, but all the changes I'd make were there, so I'm not too worried about that. It's an eight core unit. And it's got a Rage, is it a Rage? Not Rage, a Vega, Vega 56. So it's, it's got pretty well everything I need for editing in 4K. But if you're like me and you're getting frustrated with Apple, how they're forcing you to buy this big bulky machine because your RAM and your storage is soldered, you also might want to consider going Linux and going with DaVinci Resolve because DaVinci Resolve is a great application. It's not gonna cost you like um, Adobe Pro. Uh, your, or Adobe Premiere, you're looking at around, I think it's $300, $299 US for DaVinci, the full package, and you are going to need that. The, the free version, simple things such as H.265 or certain 4K modes, 
or color depth, you're going to be locked out of. So you, you're eventually going to have to spend that much money. But the nice thing about Linux is it's very open. Uh, if something fails, you can quickly replace that part with something else. You're not down. So another thing, too, is if I'm down with my, if my iMac Pro goes down, it could be a week before I get it back. And who knows what the repair bill is? So I don't even use the internal storage much. I use it for things that I'm not too concerned about, like videos or um, you know, synced files from Dropbox or iCloud or any of that stuff. All of my working files, I use an external SSD and not one of those fast ones like an MVME, an M2 MVME type. I'm just using a regular basic SATA SSD. And it's more than fast enough for editing on 4K. I have no problem whatsoever. It's, it's pretty good. And so I keep all my, so when it comes to beefing up the storage, I kind of figured, you know what? One terabyte is more than enough internally since I don't trust, you know, what if something goes? So I use my external storage and that's what really counts. So it depends on what you're editing. You really need to look at what you're editing if you're going to get into 8K or 6K. But if you're just doing 4K, then the machine I have is plenty fast. Now, if you want to get some more cores, if you want to get a better GPU, and it depends on what you're working with. If, uh, Adobe Premiere is really heavy on the processor. Uh, Final Cut is kind of balanced between using the GPU and the processor. And DaVinci Resolve, well, honestly, I don't know where what it requires. But if you're going to go into a platform like Premiere or Final Cut, you really want to find out about what system will work best, which one's scalable the most. And I think if I had to choose all over again, because when I chose Final Cut, DaVinci Resolve didn't exist as a full functional nonlinear editing system. Back then it was just a colorist type system, whereas today it's a full blown nonlinear editing system. And I think it's a great package, but I'm kind of locked into Final Cut. I don't want to switch out. I got my old files going back to 2013 and I, I still bring them up and remaster them every now and then with things that I've learned. So that's how I came up with my computer. So um, yeah, the iMac Pro I think is really good, um, but you might also want to consider DaVinci Resolve on a Linux machine. Corey asks, with the unremarkable announcements surrounding the Canon M50 Mark II specifications, do you think that Canon's going to really keep up the M mount and keep doing so for many years to come? Yeah, I do. And not because I'm an expert in all things Canon, but we've got to look at their market. And if they kill the, the M system, that leaves a hole, a pretty big gaping hole. And the M system still sells very, very well in many markets, so it doesn't make sense to kill it right now. And I think the most logical kill for that is the RF system, but they have to come up with an APS-C version of that because nobody, not everybody wants to walk around with a big, heavy, full-frame body. The APS-C produces really great results. For most ordinary filmmakers, I think APS-C is a terrific sensor. It offers smaller devices. Uh, not that you can't make smaller uh, devices with a full-frame sensor, but I, I just don't see them killing it off. I do believe that they are working on an APS-C mount, and I think what they're most likely going to do first is they're going to come out with a high-end APS-C body. But as soon as that comes out, we should expect that the a low-end version or a more affordably priced RF APS-C camera won't be too far along because people like me and you are going to be saying, well, if they've already come out with a high-end camera, that spends, spells the end for the EFM mount. And if, if I had the EF-M right now and I was looking at buying more lenses because, well, I want to grow and I don't see any sign that Canon's getting rid of it, what I might consider doing is getting L-series lenses, maybe get some older used ones, ones that aren't too expensive, and adapt them to the EF-M mount. And I know it kind of defeats the purpose of going with the EF-M, but the reason I say that, the only reason I say that, is you can't migrate EF-M lenses to the RF platform, and I don't think you can. I don't think it's even possible. When you look at the amount of difference that Canon and others would have to play, I think it's around two millimeters or just less than two millimeters, and it's very hard to make an adapter that's gonna fit in that space and be durable. So it, it is a lot of speculation and conjecture, but until we get some really solid rumors, um, or at least some news coming out of Canon, I don't see them killing it. And I was told up until recently that we weren't going to see any more EF-M mount bodies. And well, sure enough, they've gone ahead and announced the M50 Mark II. I still think the M5 Mark II is going to come out. Now, after they announce the M5 Mark II, then it might be better to have this discussion. Then I think, okay, well, we've got some really good EF-M bodies out there. We've got some good lens, especially thanks to all the third parties out there. And then maybe a year or two after that, it might be a good idea for, or it might be more realistic that we would see an APS-C 
RF body coming out. Malik asks, what do you believe will be the next budget DSLR? The 90D was a good DSLR. Is there any word on what they'll expand on it to make it better? I, look, I really do like the 90D. I had the 70D for years and I liked the 80D as well, but it wasn't enough of an upgrade over the 70D. And the 80D was the last of those series to actually offer all I. The 90D doesn't have all I. But I think for many people, it isn't going to be a really big problem. There's also the T8i, and I think that's a great camera too. I think it's around 700 and, was it? Yep, $749 for the T8i, and that's another DSLR. And I, I think they, when did they release it? It was supposed to come out in March, and then I think it was delayed until July or so. But I believe they're out for sale now, and I think that's a great camera too. And I'd say it's kind of borderline mid-range and low-end. But here's what happens. Once you start to go much below that price point, there's an awful lot of compromises. And I think when you start with the Rebel T8i, the Canon Rebel T8i, you've got a lot of really good, a lot of goodness baked in right there. And you can use the EFS lenses, you can use the EF lenses. You can't use the EFM, but there's so much good. I mean, Canon has over a hundred lenses for the EF, EFS mounts. And then of course you've got Sigma and all these other third-party lenses as well. It's, it's a great platform to be. Lenses aren't that expensive if you're willing to look at some used ones or some third-party lenses. Outside of that, um, yeah, I don't, I, and, and of course, if we look at the competition, um, but then again, we're getting into mirrorless. It's, yeah, see, Canon, because they were so late to the mirrorless game, have a lot of really good DSLRs. But when it comes to looking at Sony, I wouldn't touch Sony for their DSLRs because they've been in mirrorless so long that you're looking pretty far back in time for their DSLRs. Um, Nikon also had some good DSLRs, but like Canon, they were very late to the game. So if you go with a Nikon DSLR, while terrific for photography, on the video side, they're pretty lacking. So the, the next thing you've got to ask yourself and that I would ask you if you were right here is, are you going to be using them for video, for photo, or a balance between? And if you're looking for a balance between the T8i, I think is great. And that just came out. So we're not going to see an update there. The 90D came out last year. So we're not due for an update for about another two years. And at that point, I think it's really dependent on sales as to whether we'll get a 100D or whatever the successor is to the 90D. Sushet asks, what are your thoughts on the Fuji X-H1 versus the X-S10, which is the better overall camera? I like the XS10. First of all, it's new. It's just come out. It's got an improved autofocus system. You've got the IBIS as well. You've got overall refinements over previous versions. And the X-H1, that's a lot of money. You're pushing full frame territory there. And I don't know, it, it, you're looking at 2018, early 2018. So you're coming up to 2021. It's almost three years old. Uh, it's a little bit long in the tooth. The, I think the XS10 um, at, what is it? Um, uh, $1,000 versus $1,700 for the X-H1. Um, the, the autofocus is better, but it's still not as good. It doesn't do animal eye detection, but it does human eye detection, which works really, really well. Eye detection and face detection. And uh, I think it's a better travel camera. But yeah, the, you're looking at $700 difference in price, and that right there can get you a good lens. So yeah, the X-S10 is my choice. Shrijan asks... Global shutter decreases the dynamic range a sensor can capture. Do you think the R1 will have an option to switch between global shutter and rolling shutter? And what you're saying is true, that a global shutter doesn't have as good dynamic range. And that's something that I'd say is kind of here in the present to the past. But from the present to the future, I don't think that's really necessarily true. And my case in point is the newly announced released Red Komodo. It has a global shutter and it has 16 stops of dynamic range. Now those are stated stops, so actual is probably some, something a little bit different, but that's pretty good. So I think that as we're getting faster processors, as technology is advancing forward, I think we're gonna to get to see a point where we're gonna see a, a few more, more global shutters around, and I think dynamic range isn't gonna be so much of an issue. But um, you know, just one data point, such as the Ray Komodo, doesn't mean that everyone's gonna do that. So we'll just have to wait and see. What I always like to stress is don't focus on any one particular specification. You want to look at the overall capabilities a camera is going to give you. And the R1, let, let's be honest, guys, this is not going to be a primer aimed at video users. This is 
And I know that Canon's going to, everything they do with this R1 is going to be aimed at this type of user. They're a fast action photographer, sports photographer, event photographer, where they want to capture things at high speed. They want to capture it well. They want the quality. They want dynamic range. They want to be able to shoot a lot of frames. And also, it's good to have some nice video as well because, well, let's look at it this way. If you can shoot a couple of seconds of video at high res and be able to pull a still out of there, then you can be looking at 60 frames a second but not at 20 megapixels, 30 megapixels, you're looking at something like 12 megapixels or something like that. So there are other options they could do with video, but this, this, the R1 is a fast action sports event photographer this camera. It, it's not going to be aimed at videographers. Uh, and I think if you're looking for it for that, you're probably going to be disappointed because there's going to be several compromises. And you also might want to look at something like the C70 or even the C90 or even the C300 Mark III, which is an amazing camera. I'd love to have that camera here just for doing some of my YouTube stuff. For doing my fun and gun stuff? No, I think the R5 is more than capable. I just shot some stuff in the backyard with my son raking leaves. I shot a lot of 4K 120, and it looked great. It, it was awesome. I shot in C-Log 2 because the backyard at that time of day had some strange lighting situations, and once I graded it, it looked terrific. It really did look good, so I was quite happy with that. But again, it's all about your specifications, um, and just keep in mind that Canon, when they come out with a camera, they have a very specific user in mind, and that's the user they have in mind for the R1. Another question from Sachet. Besides the obvious increase in sharpness and detail and less noise, is there any other advantage to oversampling high-resolution video down to 4K? And how exactly is oversampling technically done? Well, how is it done? Well, here's a formula that is used for downsampling, and I'm not going to get into that level of detail. So there are many benefits to downsampling, which you've stated the, the key ones there. So for example, there's apparently less noise, not less noise, it's, it appears to be less noise. So you're taking a 45 megapixel, in the case of the R5 photo, and you're reducing it down, the image size down to, let's say, 30 megapixels. So it appears that there is definitely less noise there. And on the video side of things, um, you definitely do get more detail. Look at the C100. It's only a 1080p camera. But if you look at that 1080p, and there's plenty of videos online where you can see 1080p video and compare it to what, for example, the R5 does at 1080, and the C100 is so much better. And why is that? Because it's not shooting 1080, it's shooting 4K and downsampling in camera. So you get a lot more detail. And that's one of the biggest pluses. So how does this happen? Well, what I do is when I set up a project in Final Cut, so if I'm doing, let's say, a 4K project, I'll tell it 38 by 40 by 2160, and that means it's a UHD project. So if I take some 8K video and I bring it into that project, Final Cut does all the work for me. What it does is for every one pixel, it's got four pixels of information. So you've got more detail there. And it's kind of like in the old days when we used to create photocopies or we enlarge photos. The enlargement would never look as good because now for every, for you've got one pixel and you're essentially blowing it up to four times the size. So one pixel is trying to cover a greater area and you have less detail. So it just makes sense that when you're going the other way, um, so for example, when you downsample 4K or 8K to 4K, you got four pixels to every one and you just end up showing more detail. And what I love about downsampling is the, the effort. Uh, you don't have to do anything. The software and the hardware does all the work for you. And if you are thinking of getting the R5 to shoot in 8K and then downsample yourself, don't. It does it in camera. You, that HQ mode is you're taking full sensor 8K downsampling within the camera to give you a very detailed 4K image. The Village Mayor asks, I finally downloaded DaVinci Resolve. As someone who uses LumaFusion for video editing, I find DaVinci Resolve very complex. Is there a DaVinci Resolve for dummies for total knobs like me on YouTube? Any suggestions would be welcome. Well, this knob here, when he first started using Final Cut, I felt the same as you. I thought I was overwhelmed. It was, it was so complex and I wasn't worried if I was doing it right. I was worried if I was missing key things that I needed to do. And one of the first things I learned is, well, you want to make sure that you're you're setting up your project correctly. So since I was shooting my 70D, the max res was or video mode was 1920 by 1080 at 30 frames per second. And with Final Cut, 
All I do is if I bring one clip down to the timeline, it automatically creates the project for me saying it's a 1080 project at 30 frames per second. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that your project is set up to the right frame rate and refresh rate. Then after that, just start adding clips to the timeline. Focus on your timeline. Focus on basic editing 101, making sure you've got the right length of clip that you're, it's all fitting together really nicely. Do all that first. Get that out of the way. Don't worry about tons of effects. Don't worry about tons of transitions. The only transitions I use is, well, the butt cut and then you've got the dissolve, and then you've got the fade to color, and those are the three that I use most of the time. Masks, they can be powerful, but I'll use a mask maybe once a year because there are a lot of work to set up. So outside of that, then what's the next thing you want to focus on? Well, you want to focus on your audio. So what I would do is, A, is make sure you have a decent microphone, but the next step is edit your audio. Make sure it sounds right. Get the audio sounding good, and once you've got that done, then do your color balancing. And maybe you want to do your color balancing first. Either one. I, I like doing audio first because it's very simple. And then just look at your, your color. Make sure you're balanced properly. Now with Final Cut, they give you kind of a cheater mode where they can do an auto white balance for you. And you know what? For a while, that's what I did as a beginner. I just relied on the auto balance. Now I don't because it ca it's off enough that it can make things look a little strange. And so what I do is I just switch over and use the eyedropper and one of the reasons why my son's always wearing gray pants is, guess what I can do? I can color balance right against his pants. Uh, but you can also color balance against rocks, pavement, uh, sidewalks. There's an awful lot of stuff in nature that you can color balance again. But that's the next thing to do. You want to really make sure you got your colors right. And then once you've got that done, and one of the last things that I would do is, you know, add a score to it. Download some stuff from iTunes. Uh, some professional stuff, guys that, you know, will spend $20 million on hiring a composer to do a movie. Well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. And just focus on those basics. And then as far as, uh, you know, uh, videos for dummies, there's a lot of stuff on the internet. And what you want to figure out is, okay, what do I want to learn next? Do I want to learn how to work with color wheels a bit better? Um, uh, do I want to work with grading? Do I want to improve my grading skills? Do I want to work with masks? Uh, do I want to try stabilization? Because a lot of what I do day in and day out really doesn't change too much. Yes, there's color masks, which are very handy, and I did a video on masks not too long ago where I want to focus on my face, for example, and give it a different sort of brightness to the rest of the frame. Or maybe there's a section over here in your frame and you don't like it is and you want to darken it, but you're happy with the rest of the frame and you can sort of portion off or cordon off part of the frame and apply different settings to it. Brightness, contrast, color, and that kind of stuff. But yeah, just focus on the basics. And if you have any questions, uh, submit a comment in the comment section. I'd be more than happy to give you some advice. Joe Doc asks, will there be a Canon video camera like the Sony a7S III? Now, I really wish there was. Um, I don't know. I don't think there is. It doesn't seem like Canon's ethos. I was really hoping that the R6 was going to be the competition to answer the A7S III. Canon has never come out with a video-centric uh, hybrid camera ever, and I just don't get the sense that they're going to do that. Canon's view is if, look, if you really want a good video camera, then look at our cinema line or look at our camcorders or video cameras. They're more than capable. Um, but, you know, I, I am of a strong belief that... <sighs> While I might only use stills 5% of the time, I want a camera that's going to produce really good stills. And most video cameras or video-centric cameras or cinema cameras, they're, they're not there for stills. You're not going to get it. So now you need another device. And I still don't think the, the smartphones are there. When I want to get some great shots with the R5, I switch it over to photo mode. And it's amazing what something like a 50 millimeter will do. So, And at 45 megapixels as well. But... A video centric, a video hybrid camera from Canon, I've heard nothing, and honestly, I don't see it's going to happen. I, I, I wouldn't bet on that one. Little Eons asks Can the Canon C70 shoot 2K 120, or is it just 180 frames per second? And in those high frame rates, is it just slow motion, or can you use it at normal speed? So, just to recap, in 4K, you cap out at 120 frames per second. And in 2K, you can do 180 frames per second, and that's in Super 16 mode. But the question about slow motion, well, that's why you don't often hear cameras saying 
they do slow motion because it's all relative. The movie Gemini Man, that didn't have slow motion, but the frame rate was 120 frames per second. The camera doesn't shoot slow motion, it shoots at a certain frame rate. If you want slow motion, then you need your project frame rate. Let's say in the case of this video, it's 30 frames per second. So if I shoot in 60, I've got a slow motion by a factor of 2. 120, it's a factor of 4, and so on. But now if I shoot a film at 4K and 60 frames per second, now 120 frames per second becomes 2 times slow motion. Right? So it really depends on what your project frame rate is, and then you can divide it by the frame rate you shoot in. So yes, 120 frames per second can be normal mode if you want to do something like Gemini Man. But if you're going to do that with the R5, you're limited to 7.5 minutes before you have to start recording again, or it overheats depending on what the ambient temperature is. Now, as professionals know, Seven and a half minutes is more than enough time for a scene, and quite often they don't go more than a couple of minutes at a time before stopping and starting another scene. If you've ever been on a film set, you can see how boring it is. It can take half an hour to shoot just a minute's worth of dialogue, and actors might say the dialogue five different times just to get five different camera angles. It's really boring stuff. So hopefully that answers your question. Grinicide asks, any word on the time frame for the RF mount from Sigma, Tamron, or any other third-party glass? Sadly, no, I haven't heard anything. Uh, we were supposed to get something late this year, so that's obviously going to bounce into next year at some point, but nothing specific, nothing credible at this point. Pierre asks, do you think Canon will ever fix the overheating problems with the R5 and the R6? No, I don't think so. I think they might still make further tweaks to it, but I can't see them doing this, and no manufacturer ever has done this when it's come out with overheating issues. More or less, that's the camera, buy it if you like it or don't, and then maybe the next version fixes it to some degree. So could we get some minor improvements? Yes, but if you're living in the tropics, um, you're not going to see much of an improvement at all. And if you live in the northern climates, then yeah, you might see a bit more of an improvement just because of the range in temperatures, but most of that's going to be related to the different seasons. Summer in most of the parts of the world, you're going to feel those overheat problems. But again, those are in video modes, not in photo mode. So it really depends on what you're going to be shooting as to whether this is going to affect you a lot. Lawrence asks, do you think they'll still make an EOS R2 or an RP Mark II? Will they incorporate IBIS? Well, Lawrence, I think that the R6 is pretty much your EOS R Mark II. I've heard in the past that Canon really looks at the R and the RP as one-off cameras, more or less addressing what was at the time a lack of a mirrorless camera on the market, so they rushed these out there. And in terms of the RP, I do believe we're going to get another camera that's an entry-level um, full-frame mirrorless camera. It's going to have a similar price point of around $1,000. Very few camera companies are making uh, an entry-level uh, full-frame mirrorless camera for around $1,000. And I think they're going to pull some sacrifices. They might pull the EVF and other things to help keep the price low, but, you know, don't know really too much. Most of the rumors have said, yes, we were going to get the, quote, EOS RP Mark II later this year, or other rumors would say, well, it's a replacement for the EOS RP, but not a successor. I think it's kind of splitting hairs. But the reason why we don't see an EOS R Mark II and we see a new name like the R6 is it's almost a completely different camera. The R6 is almost like a mini 1DX Mark III. You've got the same processor. And other than frame rates, the R6 is a terrific, powerful camera uh, for most photographers. Um, sure, the, the R5 gives you 45 megapixels, gives you some other options, but 20 megapixels, if you know how to frame a shot, you can do, you can, it, it's truly incredible. You've got the IBIS, you've got better dynamic range, you've got a fast processor, the autofocus is great. So you can nail an awful lot of shots when it's dark, and the EOS R just couldn't even compare. And when you look at the starting price for the EOS R, and the R6, you can see that price-wise, the R6 is the successor. It's, it's just $100 or $200 more. And so I, what I think we're going to see with the RP, yes, we're going to see a, another um, entry-level full-frame mirrorless camera, a budget camera, around $1,000. But again, I think it's going to look a lot different from the feature set and specifications that we do currently see with the RP. A second question from Grinaside. Any idea if there'll be a firmware update bringing H.264 to the R5, or is Canon sticking with their hard-to-edit Kodak and not giving any wiggle room for flexibility? Well, as you can see from this chart here, we do have H.264 in the R5. 
and you have it in 4K and you have it in 1080. Now where H.265 comes in is, if you're going to be using C-Log, if you're going to be shooting in 10-bit, um, you're, you're going to be getting H.265, and if you're going to be shooting 8K, you're going to be getting H.265. It's almost like saying, you know, I'm going to buy a Corvette with a nice beefy V8 engine, but I want to get that fuel efficiency. Well, then you're not going to get that performance level out of it. And it's the same with H HVEC or H.265. It is a high performance codec. The file sizes are a lot smaller, so it's great for streaming. And the detail, the way it calculates, the way it compresses, H.264 would basically split the entire frame into equal blocks and compress each block. H.265 looks at it differently. Yes, when you've got a picture of, let's say, me and I'm shot up against a, you know, a beautiful sunset, it's going to look at the sunset and most of that horizon is going to be pretty blocky, but then when it comes down to me and where my hair sticks out or my hands, it's going to create smaller and smaller blocks and it's going to create a better dithering, a compression algorithm or pattern, so you've got better detail. So H.265 is going to look better. It's a lot smaller for people who are working with that, so you've got it takes up almost half the amount of space, which is terrific for me in keeping older stuff. But yeah, you're going to need more beefier hardware. So it's not that Canon hasn't given us H.264. It's there. It's there in 4K30. It's there in 1080p. It's just turn on C-Log and some of these other video modes, and you're just going to have to use H.265. But it's one of those things where we can't really blame a duck for quacking. You're going to get those performance levels. You're going to get these video modes. And if you look at any other camera, um, most of them, when you get into 4K and above, you're going to be dealing with H.265. Uh, Fuji's one of the few where, no matter what video mode you're in, they'll give you the choice of H.264 or H.265. One Focus Photo asks, Can you point me to which of your videos has the R6 record limits? If I remember right, none of the 1080 overheats, but I want to see the 4K times. Or is there a way to shoot in 1080, but it's 4K downsampled to 1080? I covered the overheat modes in this video here for both the R5 and the R6, but let's take a quick look at that chart that Canon put out there talking about the overheat modes. And as you can see here, 4K30 is going to overheat after 40 minutes. So you can record for 30 minutes, then you get another 10 minutes before it's basically in overheat mode, and that's based on 70 degrees and above, or 73 degrees and above. Now what I've noticed with the R5 is with temperatures below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the, the camera doesn't overheat. but I didn't test it with the R6 because I don't have the R6. But yes, 1080 doesn't overheat at all. There's no restrictions from overheat on the R6. Hi, Simon. I was watching the R6 versus R comparison by T-Bones Tech, and he mentioned the R has an anti-aliasing that reduces image quality, whereas the R6 doesn't, and it's 20 megapixels, has sharper images than a 30 megapixel R. Is this something that's important when shopping for a camera? Tony, now I didn't watch the video uh, by T-Bones Tech, but um, that's not true. The R6 does have an anti-aliasing filter, as does the R5, as does the 1DX. There are very select few cameras that actually don't have an anti-aliasing filter, and for the life of me, I can't remember which ones they are. I think one of the 5D R or RSs might, but I'm just, I'm just guessing. I really can't remember. The R6 does have that anti-aliasing filter, but it's better implemented. Uh, it's got a newer processor. It's got basically the, a lot of the tech from the 1DX Mark III. You've got IBIS as well. So you've got IBIS, faster processor, better autofocus, better dynamic range, low light performance. So if you're shooting in low light, all those specifications come together and give you the capabilities of producing better images, um, not missing focus, um, the way it can lock onto the eye, not just of you, but if you're shooting your pets. Taking dog photos in the past was just a pain, but with the R5 and the R6 and the eye autofocus for animals, it's bang on. So, yes, the R6 does have an anti-aliasing filter, as do most Canon uh, photo hybrid cameras, but the R5 and the R6 are a major upgrade over the EOS R uh, in many, many different ways. Nick asks, I'm a glasses wearer, and my 5D Mark IV, like most DSLRs, is a little bit of a pain when looking through the viewfinder. I was wondering if you can comment on the fit and comfort of using the Canon R5s and R6s EVFs with glasses. One issue I've come across is smashing my nose into the screen and having to really try to push my eyeglasses into the EVF. It appears the EVF eye cup sticks out a little bit further with the R5 and the R6 cameras. 
Well, most of the times when I'm shooting, I actually take my glasses off, but when they're on, I, I don't find myself smashing my nose into it. Um, I don't seem to have much of a problem with it. But, it, you know, my eyesight's a little different than yours, and maybe that can have an impact. But for short distances, that's where my glasses really kick in. And, I, yeah, I, Nick, I really can't say that I've had a problem, but unfortunately, this is one of those things where you kind of need to get the camera in hand and try it out. And I know with COVID right now, that's a very difficult thing to do. But for me, it wasn't that big of a problem. And if you've got the 5D, then I can't imagine it's going to be that much worse than that. But this is really one of those very personal things. And today I was shooting with my glasses on and I didn't really have much of a problem with it. But also what I tend to do, unless I'm doing portraits, is I just use the LCD to tap on that, focus and shoot the shot. And it works quite well and I can hold it far enough away that I don't really need the reading glasses anymore. And even if I have my reading glasses on, I still like to bring it into the computer to see how well I nailed the shot. JC asks, what are your expectations of the Sony FX6 that is still rumored to be releasing soon? I don't have a lot of expectations, and that's mainly because Sony doesn't give us a lot. They really hold on to their secrets, as we saw with the Sony a7S III earlier this year, and while we had some leaks, a lot of them proved not to be accurate. So very simply, I see the FX6 as sitting between the Sony a7S III and the Sony FX9, so this is obviously a video-centric camera, and it's going to have a lot of benefits there, but it's not going to be enough to beat out, obviously, the FX9. And I think that's the thing. So if you really like the a7S III, but you would like to have things like built-in ND filters, that's kind of things I'd expect to see with the FX6, because ND filters make a huge difference. You'd want to have, I can't imagine that they wouldn't produce a camera without built-in ND filters and some of the other capabilities that make this a video-centric camera. Johnny asks, can we convert Canon files to ProRes, and if so, do we lose any quality? Yes, you certainly can. I use a Mac, and so I can best talk to a Mac. On Windows, there are utilities you can use to convert to ProRes, and I can't speak to those because I don't use them. But on the Mac, I use Apple's program called Compressor. It's $50 US, and I just simply take all my files, and I can batch process them. I bring them in, and I choose Apple ProRes 422. Now, you're not going to... It's not going to make the quality worse. You'll actually find out that your file sizes are a little bit bigger. I shoot all I, and so my file sizes might be around 10 to 15% bigger. But the, the quality doesn't get worse. If you're doing ProRes 422 or ProRes 444 or ProRes RAW, you're not going to get anything worse than what you started with. Now, if you use some of the other codecs like ProRes HQ or LQ, I can't remember which ones they are, you might get some quality loss, but I always use ProRes 422. And the great thing about editing with ProRes 422 is you're not going to, as you, if you're really aggressively editing and doing color grading and a whole bunch of effects and whatnot, it, it's not going to beat down the file format. Whereas if you're editing all I files, it certainly is. And another big plus to editing ProRes, depending on your software, it's, a, it's an awful lot quicker. Especially if you're on an Apple platform or using Final Cut, then ProRes is just a breeze to edit. And our last question is from Siegfried. Simon, what are you hoping to see in further firmware updates for the R5? Well, Siegfried, there's about three big things that Ken has talked about putting in. 120 frames per second as an option in 1080, C-Log3, and Cinema Light Raw, plus various other small enhancements and bug fixes. But that brings us to the end of another Q&A video. Thank you to everybody like Siegfried for submitting a question. You have earned an extra entry into the contest details or the contest for the Canon EOS R5 and all other contests up to 100,000 subscribers when I will announce the winner for the Canon EOS R5. But I do really appreciate everybody who has not only submitted a question, but you guys watching at home, um, participating, providing comments and engaging. I really do appreciate that. I'll keep doing these videos as long as there's demand. And to me, if I can get at least 15 questions for a weekend to do one of these videos, then I'm going to go ahead and produce a video. Now, if it starts to drop below that, then I'll start doing these videos once a month or maybe once every two weeks. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. Don't forget to subscribe for your chance to win the Cinco Lav S6E and M3 shotgun microphones. I'll be awarding those two prizes to one lucky viewer once this channel reaches 20,000 subscribers. And then, for every 10,000 subscribers after that, I'll be offering up a new and better and more expensive prize to one lucky viewer, all the way up to 100,000 subscribers, at which point, I'll be giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full-frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer. 
And on that bombshell, thanks for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. We'll see you again soon.